Hello and welcome. I'm Peter. Let's make progress, not perfection. But on that way to progress, pitfalls are inevitable. And today's topic is what we in the FGC call autonomous ultra inst. <laughs> Whoops, I mean, autopilot. <laughs> the formal term for autopiloting is automaticity, which is defined as the ability to do things without occupying the mind, where actions are done spontaneously or, or, or subconsciously rather. Automaticity, which I will be referring to as autopiloting from now, is not typically a bad thing and actually helps us with everyday tasks. For example, actions like walking or riding a bike are prime examples of autopiloting at its best. We don't really need to actively think about performing the motions. We just do it. For fighting games, this is also not necessarily a bad thing. Autopiloting can take over for things like block punishing, performing a staple bread and butter combos, uh, performing anti airs on the opponent, and moving to avoid certain strings or dodging to avoid certain strings. By autopiloting these types of situations that I just named, we can save our mental energy for the more demanding tasks, such as choosing a wake up option or perhaps analyzing our opponents at a, at a distance, or determining how to get out of a corner. Autopiloting lets us save brain power for more important things by making the routine and mundane more mechanical. So that's awesome, right? That's, that's fantastic. So what's the drawback? Well, sometimes we autopilot when we shouldn't. Let's say we land an attack that is advantageous on block. Most of us immediately want to press the advantage and pressure the opponent. Or perhaps we land one low attack against the opponent and then immediately repeat that same move. Sounds familiar? On the surface, pressuring when at a frame advantage is a fantastic idea, great idea. But autopiloting this option every single time can be risky. And as far as the age-old trick of throwing out a low attack into an immediate low attack, well, I'm sure we all have had first-hand experience and knowledge of how well this works. But let's go a little bit deeper into another example. The round starts, we press some buttons, the opponent presses some buttons, we get some hits, the opponent pressures us a pack, and then this exchange continues on and on. Until we land a solid hit from somewhere, at which point we shift the momentum and then we win the round. We aren't sure exactly why we won the round or why we chose the attacks that we did. But ultimately, all we know is that we won or, or lost. If this happens to you, then you are autopiloting. The process of fully autopiloting fighting games is not particularly noticeable sometimes, or rather seemingly benign at lower levels of play because, well, it, it just happens. We do it subconsciously. But this is incredibly dangerous against a skilled opponent because autopiloting can be predictable. And it also prevents growth because we can't really tell what we did right or what we did wrong. It just happens. And that's just the nature of autopiloting because it's the subconscious portion of the brain just taking over for the conscious portion. Let's look at why autopiloting happens. So how is it that we as fighting game enthusiasts become such autonomous autopilot junkies. Take for example this situation. Paul throws out back one two. And, and mind you, yes, I know the second hit you're supposed to duck, but let's assume that we don't know the second hit we have to duck. Paul throws out back one two, and we respond with a jab. Not saying that this is right or wrong, but why did we autopilot into this jab as a response? The answer is the result of the learning process that we typically go through. And it's a process of learning, repetition, and practice. When we first start playing fighting games, we begin the learning phase. We find out that quick attacks like jabs are usually safe. They are fast, recover quickly, and give advantage frames on block or hit. Then we begin the process of repetition. 
we utilize this knowledge that we just acquired about the jab and repeat things like the jab over and 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 over, confirming their usefulness. Now comes the last step of solidifying that autopiloting. Practice, practice, practice. And practice doesn't necessarily mean practice mode. No, 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 no. I mean, it can, but not always. Through just hours of sheer play, we cement the making of an autopiloting response. Now, going back to the Paul example that we had of blocking back one, two, let's say we've developed the habit or the, the autopiloting jab when Paul is at minus five after back one, two. Suddenly, we come across a skilled player who notices this. And this is what happens. Too much autopiloting, not good. How can we avoid it? The first technique to avoiding autopiloting is to pay explicit, explicit attention to the task at hand, which is known as the centipede's effect. In the fabled story, The Centipede's Dilemma, a toad immobilizes a centipede by asking it one question. How does it walk? The centipede's normally subconscious locomotion here is interrupted by the conscious reflection of how it walks. Let's use an easy example, King's 2-1 string. After 2-1, 95% of King players, 95. Just autopilot between giant swing, Tijuana twister, and executioner's drop, or insert any other throw, really. To stop autopiloting, we need to break the association. Break the association. That is to say, in this example, we need to break the association between 2-1 and throws. We need to ask ourselves, what other options can we do after 2-1? Just like the toad in the centipede's dilemma asking the question of how can the centipede walk, we need to ask ourselves, what do we do after 2-1 as king? Well, we can sidestep to avoid linear attacks. We can use a standing one to stuff out options that are 12 frames or slower, or we can try down one two to crush high attacks, or even use down forward one to catch uh, opponents who are trying to duck the throw. There are a lot of different options, but the bottom line is we need to ask what else can we do? But we don't always just wanna ask questions every single time for every single decision uh, and response because like the centipede, this might immobilize us or paralyze us, causing us to respond too slowly. Another tip to minimize the amount of autopiloting that we do is playing slower. When we play too quickly, we tend to autopilot more and this is only natural. Slow down the pace of your game is a great starting point to reducing the amount of autopiloting. And this sentence right here, this sentence right here is a prime example of that. See, most of you probably were reading this too quickly and just autopiloted. There are two does in the sentence, but your brain subconsciously filtered out the second one. And this is exactly what happens in fighting games. Try to not immediately press buttons after your attack or your opponent's attack, even if it feels natural. Sometimes we just need to give ourselves a little bit more time to process what exactly is going on. However, slowing down the pace of the game isn't about just not mashing buttons. It can be as simple as playing more defensively or observing the opponent. Let's check out some examples. The first example we're gonna look at is an Evil 2019 of Smash Ultimate. We see here we have Samsura's Peach versus Proto Bantam's Lucina in Loser's Quarters. Samsura, after knocking Proto Bantam off of the stage, he waits to see what Proto will do. Instead of rushing in and then just pressuring Proto while he's recovering, Samsura's analyzing and trying to understand Proto as a player and his tendencies as a player. Will he go for something like a ledge roll? Will he do a get off the ledge attack? Uh, or will he do a ledge jump or, or something else? And all the while, Proto's doing the exact same thing. Look how slowly he's approaching uh, center stage, how tentative he is. He's not rushing for stage control, but instead he's just walking over casually. We see this yet again at EVO 2019 Grand Finals between Arslan Ash and Nii. This whole set is filled to the brim with fast paced gameplay, but what we often overlook was the moments where the gameplay slowed down. In round two, after Nii had been knocked down by Arslan Ash, he tries to recollect himself. He takes a low hit, he rolls away from the wall, takes a low hit, rolls away from the wall, and then gets back on his feet. 
And when he does so, he just starts backdashing to create space and slowing things down, creating distance. And all the while, he's looking for an opportunity to whiff punish. And when the opportunity arises, bam, he capitalizes on it. Now, another technique that we can use to stop the autopiloting, besides just slowing down the pace of the game, is to focus intensely on the match at hand. But doing so can be very strenuous and very mentally exhausting. So for starters, just try one round each set. At a distance, we should ask ourselves, which option should I use here? Instead of just throwing something out. I'm looking at you, King players who throw out forward forward one, Ganon players who throw out down B, and Ken players who just throw out sure you. But, but in all seriousness, after throwing out a move, we should ask ourselves, why did we do it? What did we expect from the opponent? What exactly did the opponent do? We should have a reasoning behind it, such as conditioning, spacing, pressuring, stalling, etc., 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 regardless of whether the move landed or it whiffed or it got blocked. The answer to why we did something cannot simply be, I don't know, I, I, I don't know, I, I threw the move out there. I, I thought it was going to land. Every attack needs to have a purpose. So all in all, it's not until we are conscious of our autopiloting behaviors that we can start correcting for it, right? After all, we can't know a thing that we don't know. So until we are aware of our autopiloting and know what we are doing, we can't correct for this or improve on it. Thanks for watching guys and joining me on this video. Also, thank you so much patrons for your ever so gracious support. Without you, this would have not have been possible. And if you're new here and you like what you see, consider subscribing and hitting that bell notification icon. Below in the descriptions, as always, I also have my links to my Discord, Twitter, Twitch, and Patreon page. See you next time.